The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, direct all of you on a special holiday week. <laughs> Is the four center podcast feed up, Cat Dabs? <laughs> uh, for a second there, I thought you had been replaced by Shatner. That was that was a lovely, uh, surprising, uh, very jazzy orchestration of the intro uh, to Four Center. I'm I'm inspired by you, so I'll say I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. <laughs> the pregnant pause works, <laughs> yes. And third, but most important on our team today, and I'm. Jennifer Lando on this special edition of Four Center. <laughs> uh, that was uh, that was uh, some gravitas. Uh, that was some gravitas. <laughs> that was some uh, investigative reporting. Uh, oh here. my gosh! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey everybody! This is a Four Center podcast feed. We're having a lot of fun discussing Star Wars and looking at Star Wars news. Though I better get the right. Uh, I better get the right rundown. I almost started answering questions. That's another show we got going on here. Uh, we're recording on a, a 4th of July holiday here, releasing all of you here on Tuesday. That's just in case some uh, news drops. And we're going to get to some wonderful news. In fact, we got a we got a very fun news story, a little picture, which means we have officially reached Adendor season, and we're excited about that. Before we get to all that, we want to let you know, as always, today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download at a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Four Center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. A little bit later, we have a Four Center recommends an audiobook we think you should try out on us. Uh, Joseph, Jennifer, uh, I'm I'm here. I'm awake. I've had I've had cu- a couple cups of coffee already. Uh, this, uh, <laughs> I am now one of those old men that wakes up too early, not by choice, but by a four year old Chihuahua that just wants to take on the day at six thirty. So uh, <laughs> every time we record now, I'm I'm here with coffee. How are all you? How are all your Star Wars adventures and life adventures, uh, Joseph? Uh, I, I I saw some wonderful photos by the beach, which mean mean you you probably had a good weekend. I did. I had a very good weekend. Very lucky. There's been a lot of stress in uh, in life and every aspect of life. So it was really nice to be able to uh, get away a little bit. Uh, I've mentioned it before in the podcast. My wife and I like taking a, a quick trip to Ventura. It is like an hour drive from where we live in Hollywood to this town of Ventura. But then we stay on a at a little uh, inn that is right by the beach. And it's like you drive an hour and go to an entirely different reality. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the ocean is right there and everything you're doing, if, you know, is just sort of dictated by that sound and that rhythm and that reconnection uh, to nature. Mm-hmm. So it's always a Star Wars adventure uh, to go to the ocean and feel like, ah, yes, this is like the force. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> This is what it's about, uh, the nature, the relaxing. Uh, so yeah. I was very, very lucky to do that. Uh, and then we returned yesterday from Ventura and we went to the Hollywood Bowl. It's the first time we've been back um, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we saw the Steve Martin and Martin Short 4th of July fireworks spectacular. <laughs> oh, I, was, I went to that years ago. Yeah. yeah, I didn't realize how long they'd been doing it. And I was like, I had no idea what to expect. Was it just be like, here's a joke. Here's a firework. Here's a joke. Here's a firework. <laughs> oh uh, but gosh. yeah, it was it was amazing. I've been you know fans of both mm-hmm. of them for a long time. Steve Martin in particular has been an inspiration for some of the kind of uh, comedy that that I do mm-hmm. that I like doing in in. Uh, so that was really, really great. They were hilarious. It was just like an hour of like very kind of if you see a performer in Vegas and like, here's our jokes and <laughs> here, here's a song and here's some bits and then yeah. amazing fireworks. The, the fireworks are amazing, mostly in that I don't know how they don't set the Hollywood Hills on fire, but it's amazing. <laughs> um, so I had all these great adventures and then it's it, it's fun at this point to go like, I know I'm going to go do things that aren't Star Wars specific, but I know Star Wars will find a way. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um so we, uh, in Ventura, we, we like to stop at this antique store. It's got some uh, Star Wars figures, and I always stop and, and look at those. Uh, but there's also this, like, uh, glassware section that my wife really likes of, of staring at them and considering buying things. And uh, I saw this set of four glasses, and I was like, these are beautiful. I want these. I never, uh, you know, mm-hmm. come over here and want the glasses. Uh, <laughs> and they're the kind of like... Um, kind of wine champagne sort of a like a flute like cocktail glass uh, but then they have these diamond shape uh, colors in them and mm-hmm. at first i saw the blue one i was like that's beautiful i need that I'm like oh it's a set of four. Oh, there's a green one 
oh, a red one. Oh, a kind of yellow golden one. And like, oh, wait, these are lightsaber colors. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is this is missing a mace's purple. But besides that, yeah. this is a set of cocktail glasses with lightsaber colors. And that is part of the reason that I'm drawn mm. to it and didn't even realize. <laughs> didn't even think. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So we we picked those up. And then I also picked up the uh, they have they had the the it was kind of Revenge of the Sith era, maybe a little bit later. They did these uh, packs of action figures that also came with kind of a new versions of the old Burger King glasses. So it's the Revenge mm-hmm. of Sith, Obi-Wan, uh, you know, flames everywhere, and then a, like kind of a Burger King glass. So it was really fun. We got a bunch of like nice glassware <laughs> that we brought up to the front. And it's like, I have one more piece of glassware. This <laughs> Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, <laughs> tumbler for 12-year-olds. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm Obi-Wan Kenobi, and I want a Whopper that's flame broiled here on Mustafar. I get it. What a cross yep. Yeah, so it was it was great. Uh, Star Wars popped up in many little ways throughout the trip, but a really nice weekend and some fun Star Wars in there. So those are my adventures. Uh, that's great. Mine's pretty simple. I think I was hoping, Joseph, that you and I, uh, not, you know, for your your case, I wouldn't want this in, in your life normally. That you and I were a dyad because I, I I saw the, the <laughs> pictures by the ocean and and uh, it's been a while since I've been to the sea, whether it be my uh, hometown Pismo Beach area area, area or anywhere else. And I just I, I I don't like this. I like you can make your sand jokes. I don't love sand. <laughs> the ocean itself kind of intimidates me, but I love being near it and hearing. And, and hearing the roar and hearing the waves, it is truly therapeutic. So I saw some of your photos and kind of did the like, oh, if I could only be in Shell Beach right now. My own <laughs> <laughs> if you, yeah, if you have the time, I highly encourage it. It is really great. It is so weird. I was thinking about this weekend because I've been mm-hmm. like, every time we go, like baby steps to uh, actually interacting with the sand in the water uh, to the <laughs> point where like, I was, I was walking barefoot along the edge yeah. of the ocean and letting it just kind of lap over my feet. And that's like, yeah. that's a huge step forward for me uh but i have to keep cleaning sand and it, anakin has changed my life i cannot engage with the sand without thinking anakin's right it does get everywhere every time I, even when i was at the the height of it being like a, a joke at the expense of the prequels and I, I still think it's sometimes there but you know that era where it was like this is the epitome of why we hate these that joke right. that line I still would be like, you all never grew up on the beach then and you aren't a surfer <laughs> kid who got st- who can stuck play. And I play with my Star Wars figures in the sand and and do what you just what you described. I do do my little barefoot walk. I don't mind that at all, barefoot walk by the, the shores there. But man, you're digging out that sand for days, days. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I know I it's it. I know it's with me somewhere in the apartment. I just don't know where. <laughs> I know it came back with me. I have to find it. There you go. So that, yeah, I think some of my adventures, uh, you know, relaxing, but busy work. And I did finally determine, here's the big one. Uh, I did finally determine where I was going to uh, store and display the Emperor's Royal Guard figure that uh, Joseph had obtained for me at Star Wars Celebration. Um, oh. It's next to my Palpatine, but the Palpatine is, uh, you know, uh, one of the more recent Palpatines uh, that was released this year. And it's still in package, but the guard is next to it, <laughs> guarding the package. Yeah. <laughs> Appropriate. Yes. There you go. Nobody opens the Emperor on his watch. <laughs> uh, Jed, what about you? Did Star Wars find its way into your life? It did. Uh, I was finishing up a piece. I did an interview uh, for StarWars.com um, with uh, Chris Reif, who is the Hasbro product designer. And he's also part of HasLab. And as you guys know, HasLab is an incredible crowdfunding platform that has brought to life, uh, what was it, Jabba's sail barge? Remember that four foot long mm-hmm. sail barge that they did? Mm-hmm. Uh, the Razor Crest, an incredibly detailed version of the Razor Crest. And they now have currently Riva's Force Effects Elite Lightsaber. Mm. It is double bladed. You can reconfigure the handle so it's either the hilt, so it's like, you know, the full circle, like Inquisitor style, or the half circle, which is unique to Riva. It is incredible. And so I got a chance to speak with him and find out more about this lightsaber. And if you're a collector, You'll appreciate the article because we got into the nitty gritty. I mean, I was doing research. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like, let me, let me understand awesome. this. Uh, but Chris was awesome. So that'll be up on StarWars.com, I think today, technically, July 5th. Um, right. So that was exciting. And right. then the other thing, the other venture, which was not this weekend, but it was last week. Oh, Joseph and I, am I allowed to mention this? <laughs> 
I think oh, so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Joseph and I went head to head, toe to toe. Okay. No, it was a fr- friendly, friendly sparring um, on Rotten Tomatoes show Binge Battle, uh, where we talked about Obi Wan Kenobi and some of our favorite things, favorite moments, favorite characters, favorite scenes. Joseph, I mean, it's like for me, I was joking with Joseph before. I'm like, it's I'm the apprentice and Joseph is a master. Like, it just felt so weird. <laughs> and obviously, we're friends, you know. So I, I mean, and I agreed with basically everything Joseph said. So <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah. yeah. No, I I agreed with you, and you you made you made such solid choices. Uh, I was telling Ken afterwards, like I, you know, I always come at these things. The binge battle thing is just it's just for fun, right? And yeah. I, I have the painful, like, well, why do we have to pick a favorite? Ob- binge battle mm-hmm. is is for fun, and the whole point is fun. But I always <laughs> wrestle with that of why are we picking a favorite? Jennifer's right about everything she's saying. <laughs> she's so right. You picked great topics and you defended them so well. I just I wanted it to just go. Jennifer's right. Can we move on? No. <laughs> Oh, no, I mean, I just was kind of like, let's just launch into this discussion. Is it is this supposed to be a debate? Because I was like, yeah, agreeing with Joseph's points. Yes, I want to see that 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 come to life in season two, or you know. So that was really fun. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I felt like so much Star Wars packed in to this uh, past week, and then mm. I just have been kind of like a blob today. Yeah, that's fine. We'll blob our way through it. Yeah, and I and I think that episode comes up. Very soon. Uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, hanging out with Mark Ellis Saturday night, who, of course, hosts the show. And I said, how'd that go? And he says, I couldn't have imagined two more perfect people to Aww. discuss Obi-Wan that week. So it's going to be a great episode. Uh, and yes, yes. Uh, we don't have to fight over everything. We can just That's have right. some fun discussing Star Wars. No, and the, the whole thing is great fun. And from a perspective yeah. of, of fun and Jennifer, I, you just did an amazing job, I think. Oh, thank you. You as always, Joseph. I mean, just so <laughs> it's so enlightening. You know, <laughs> it's like getting lost in in your uh, in your discussion. So that was it was a blast. I, th- I think that's a Peter Gabriel song. In your discussion, <laughs> so. in I your so. points, <laughs> they were <laughs> fantastic. We there we go there we go all right let's get to some star wars news and yes on the morning of recording we got a little drop but i think it's a big drop because it is uh the first step into an end or world don't forget star wars next show and or august 31st we're almost there we're almost there we're still basking in the glory of kenobi but uh we've got this picture from empire magazine an exclusive and this is this is those days where it's just fun to be a Star Wars fan because you you know we're gonna get a few minutes discussion out of just two dudes on a speeder. That's what we got here today. Uh, we have got uh, this photo was released. Um, that was uh, we got. Let me get it up. Uh, make sure. Okay, so Stella, we got Stellan Skarsgård in his Luthan character riding on the back of Diego Luna's Cassian. Andor uh, riding the speeder with the leather jacket. Andor's got longer, thicker hair. He's got a beard. He looks like he's in Easy Rider from 1969. Oh, I love yes, this yes. shot, but let's dive on in. Jennifer, uh, take us into your uh, into your initial reaction to this photo. You know, the photo really took me by surprise because usually I can kind of like think they're expected. It's not a lot that they give us, but, but the mm-hmm. determination – on uh cassian's face right and he looks just the epitome of cool like you're saying with a leather jacket mm. on this speeder he's on a mission hair blowing in the wind and then still is still in scars guard behind him <laughs> uh, he looks uh either he i can't i can't figure out what his expression is is either hesitation <laughs> He's not sure. Uh, it also looks like he's not really holding on very well. So maybe that's where this this look is coming from. But um, uh, there's a lot going on in this photo. I thought I even joked to Joseph off air. Like he he looks sick uh, or <laughs> photoshopped in. Even like he's on the back there. I, I'm, yeah. I mean, he's not. He's there. This is uh, it's uh, it's a great uh, one two punch of expressions. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Where yeah. are they going? What are what are they about to do? It looks like they're about to do something dramatic. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Jo- Joseph, your gut reaction and which face would you make? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, tag yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I want to be Andor, but sometimes I'm Luthan. You know, I think it happens <laughs> to all of us. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think uh, Andor, uh, man, the hair flying, I love, this is, Cassian mm-hmm. is, you know, he is, he is a boss yeah. when it comes to Star Wars jackets, and it looks mm-hmm. like that is oh, going to yeah. continue. I love the sort of the dirty, 
crimson. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So the jacket I'm really affected by. Uh, Luthen, I think, seems to be like this character who's probably going to be like, you know, hey, we, we got to get this done, but also not yeah. sure about lots of things. And it's, it seems clear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that it yeah. really looks like Andor's like, you know, nope, nope, we're going to Taco Bell. And Luthen's like, I don't know. I've had a bad experience <laughs> at Taco Bell. Um, I'm also affected by, I cannot clear the pop ups on the site that I'm looking at. So it looks yes. like they're both deeply angry at the endless ads for Northgate Market. <laughs> Yeah, we're, looking at the, we're looking at the same ones here. I'm like, God bless your pages. You got to get your advertisement. This is, I, 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 I get it. I get it. But like, I've tried to, this entire conversation have been popping down 19 pop-ups here. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. I get it. I get it. Uh, and, Carl's uh, thank Jr. you. Thank mm. you. To, yeah. Thank you to our sponsors uh, of Four yes. Center as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I'm with you. I'll get, I'll get my one last joke out of the way here. I guess this Luther looks like me on, on, on the pegs on BMX bikes growing up where my friends were like, just hop on the back. We'll ride around the corner. I'm like, I don't think my mom says this is unsafe. I'm just going to try to hold on and not fall off on those rear, uh, uh, rear tire pegs. Um, yeah, look, I love, this is, uh, you talk about the, the, the color of his jacket almost matches the speeder, but anyways, I just, I just love, uh, the determination this, you know, to, to have this photo kind of be one of the first to pop out just speaks of, of the action we're going to get. It just speaks of, of the choices Andor's going to make. And, you know, you can dig in, we can dig in pretty deep to one photo around these parts, but it's also, it just looks like Star Wars, which is that mm-hmm. weird the standard we all hold things to, that magical, well, does it feel like Star Wars? And one shot in, here we go. It feels like Star Wars to me. So I'm, I'm starting there, Jen, you know? Yeah, and I and I look at this and immediate, it feels very consistent with the color schemes and the lighting that we saw in Rogue One. It makes me think about the Book of Boba Fett and why people obviously were upset about uh, the, the mods and things like that and the color scheme that they used. Clearly here they are sticking with a Star Wars color palette. <laughs> Joseph, like you said, with his jacket, just all of it is very <laughs> muted um, and dare I say gritty, quote unquote. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah I, I like it. It's really consistent with what we've seen uh, in Rogue One. So, Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. not, I mean, the, the jacket is, is g- cool, but even that red is extremely muted and everything mm-hmm. looks like stripped down. Like, I mean, it might just be like the angle of that speeder bike, but this looks like the speeder bike that's just barely holding together, uh, yeah. much like uh, Luthen's lunch, barely holding together. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> this is like a mystery science theater. Yeah. Like, has anyone ever done that with Star Wars? Like where it's just mystery science theater style the whole movie? Because this would yeah. kind of be ripe for it. I, I don't know yeah. why. Yeah, yeah, no, the the rift tracks. Uh, oh team. yes, of course, yeah, the rift uh, yeah. tracks. Oh my uh, gosh, some yes. jokes for the Force Awakens for rift tracks. Uh, That's right. Yeah. yeah. God, what what was what was the scene you lived go. with? You lived with that scene, Joseph, for months, right? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> seven, uh, oh, like so, yeah, right? a, good, a good solid uh, you know week uh, watching uh, Han and crew enter uh, Maz's castle. That was that was <laughs> I my scene. Go. I yeah, um, we're having fun with this picture. I'm just it, it actually this picture is actually making me giddy because I'm just excited to enter Andor season. I, I'm still going to mm-hmm. bask in Kenobi like we said up top. I ain't ready to leave that show. I actually um, rewatched it over the last couple of days. Uh, just had it on, just kind of you know like put it on, put it on, and and and. Um, live with it in my house on you know and it just was was fun but I, i'm so looking forward to the series as, as you all know i keep talking about it just just for many reasons and some of it is just uh i can't wait to learn more of, of this character of andor and, I, and i'm honored and uh, i feel honored as a fan and blessed that we get another chance to 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 uh, spend some time with with diego luna in star wars uh and and photos like this uh just get me geeked up the nerd chills are appearing and I'm getting ready for a fun new star wars story yeah yeah no, I agree. It, it is really fun to be now in this uh, kind of official transition <laughs> mm-hmm. where the Obi-Wan season is is wrapping up and we're slowly transitioning into Andor season. And I'm really happy for both of them because I think they do represent kind of uh, different extremes in Star Wars from the very uh, Force Jedi Sith yeah. uh, to the, the, you know, gritty the the most brightly colored thing in this entire photo is Luthen's face. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, the trailer is uh, pretty serious. Uh, we know Andor himself is, you know, he he's not wisecracking a lot when he's out there. He's got a lot on his mind and soul. Uh, but I'm looking forward to finding where some of the the bits of Star Wars joy are going to come into the story mm-hmm. too. Mm. And uh, 
if, if it's Luthen's face, for, we'll take that for right now and build from there. Uh, any final thoughts on this photo as we uh, move on, Jen? One last thing I'll say is, that, and it's, I'm, I'm probably reading into this because of the quote that Tony Gilroy uh, gives in the article, the scale of the show is so huge. I get that from just this little photo. Yeah. And I don't know why, but it feels it feels very cinematic. It feels very big, very epic. Uh, maybe it's like that that in the background, I'm like, what is what is that structure behind them? It looks really massive. So um, I'm excited. It's going to feel like a movie on our on our computer on my computer screen <laughs> <laughs> on my phone yeah yeah, yeah, yeah right no, I, but i feel i feel yeah, absolutely excited uh, excited about the comments about the scope and and even that second season which is going to move uh, through the timeline a little faster uh, mm -hmm. but in, in, a, in a bigger way um yeah excited about this there uh, joseph any final thoughts uh on the photo or the interview or both all uh, you've, uh, carte blanche is uh, carte blanche. your oh, choice okay. uh, yeah no you're the, the you're at the photos. sizzler buffet <laughs> oh well uh, that's Jesus. what they're advertising on this pop-up right now yeah. um yeah the uh the the photo just kind of does speak of you know desperation and danger and scale and all that is great um i really like uh what is being said uh by by tony gilroy um who i think you know just cannot be contained when it comes to talking about uh the absolute details of this show's structure yeah. um, <laughs> but i really like what he's saying that they they went with three episode arcs mm -hmm. all, all those arcs directed by the same person for a total of four arcs of 12 episodes and then going on to talk about how the second season they went with that same structure or are going to go with that same structure but each three episode arc will be leading up to the events of rogue one all very cool stuff uh i think it's exciting for me because i, I want there to be the star wars buffet right i want the shows mm -hmm. to be different from one another and I think uh, with 12 episodes and with four three episode arcs, it's just structurally very different in the way that the show is going to move than Obi-Wan Kenobi or anything mm. in the Mandoverse. And I think, mm. you know, when they talk about like uh, scope and scale, I, it seems to me that they're talking sometimes about like how deeply we're going to know the situation, mm. how deeply we're mm. going to know the people uh, on in Cassian's orbit, in, in Mon Mothma's orbit. And that really speaks to me of being different from the Mandoverse, because I think the Mandoverse has this uh, very traditional Star Wars tip of the iceberg storytelling, right? It's uh, Ken, you and I have talked about it being almost sort of like a day in the life, you know, of yeah. mm. you, you don't need to know what a bounty puck is or how it works. You know, you don't need to know the details of a past relationship that Mando had. It's just a, a thing for you to wonder about it, you know, and I think that's a great style storytelling which has this great uh, star wars tradition but it feels like everything that they're telling us about this show very so far is the opposite that it's gonna mm. uh, this is gonna be not a tip of the iceberg show but a drill down show really get stuck in uh, the details you know so it makes me think it's gonna feel like you know the americans or you mm. know 24 or game of thrones or these shows that kind of have a big concept but get into all these little details and i'm excited mm. for a different kind of storytelling in star wars Mm -hmm. we, yeah, well said there. And, and the 12 episode run, we, we keep making jokes about, you know, we all grew up with 22 episode network seasons and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it does feel long. And I'm, I, I, I hope uh, people have a lot of, um, I guess patience is the word. I, I, there's no other way to look at it. Just patience to get through the story. Because I got to imagine we're going to be building piece by piece as we spend more time with those characters. You know, we, we got we got a guy uh, banging away at a gong there. The, the time, uh, what, what's his name? I forgot. The Time the Lord? The Time no. Grappler. Time oh, Grappler. Yeah. Time Lord yes. is another series. Yes. <laughs> okay. um, maybe the Time Lord and the Time Grappler will meet. You know, we, we're, we are going to spend that time. And I, 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 and I just, um, you know, Bad Batch was what sixteen episodes, and that was long too. I just, uh, I, 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 I really am excited for for uh, this type of storytelling. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, again, well said indeed. Yeah, you're getting me more. You're getting me more excited, Joseph. And awesome. our season. Here we go. Awesome. Yeah. Here we go. Mm, Joseph, yay. in terms of like traditional, uh, you know, uh, series, how, is that normal to have like a four part arc? Because I felt like Kenobi worked so well because it was like the three the three act right. So is this is this typical? Like what? What can we expect from it? I mean, I think it is a little bit more of a television, you know, style structure than, mm. and I think, I think Mando has been very, very episodic, right? That there right. is like one kind of main story, you know, main one main quest that Din is on both mm. of the seasons, and kind of same with Boba Fett. But then the episodes are really kind of divided to be 
uh, episodic, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. And then, and then Kenobi was this kind of weird in between where you could still feel the three act movie structure, right. but there's an effort to make it episodic. And this feels like there's no desire <laughs> <laughs> to be movie like in any way. It's just a, you know a, a longer uh, television. To, like I, I think this would be a normal way to to approach a season of television, like a streaming season of television. Got so, it. You know, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, and and the the having the different the directors each director do an arc it really does feel like we we have a big picture story that we want to tell and we're building to it with these chapters Mm. love that that's cool well this all begins in about 56 days Uh, Uh we will help you all get ready for andor as we build our excitement for this coming series all right now let's uh that's looking ahead let's look back because that seems to be in the news a lot. Now, <laughs> we'll start here by saying this. Uh, uh, we do love hearing uh, thoughts and insights on writers and creators and all that kind of stuff. I think there's, there's um, you can get into that dangerous, not what if territory, but how come uh, they didn't and they should have, which are uh, not my favorite conversations to have, not speaking for Joseph or Jennifer there. Um, but it's fun to get other ideas and what was out there. So that's, that's my little, I don't know if I'm out of place for even starting the conversation <laughs> that way, but I just wanted to put that out there uh, uh, before we get into the news uh, of, of Stuart Beatty, uh, the collateral screenwriter who had the uh, kind of uh, first in on the Kenobi story when it was a, a movie and a lot of the stuff last week, we even touched upon it a little bit uh, with the interview run by the director, which uh, uh, Stuart Beatty revealed that he had pitched and kind of had planned three movies in an Obi-Wan trilogy. And there's some, very interesting things in in that. But this week, more of that interview came out with many of his planned details and differences. And there was a lot, I, you know, even more than the headline. I kind of clicked on the headline thinking, oh, let's hear about this one. And there's just a ton of stuff in there. So it's mm-hmm. interesting. We'll dig them up. And, and, and to you, Joseph and Jennifer, feel free to pull anything in. We're <laughs> focusing on the, on the biggest one, uh, perhaps being that he had planned for Commander Cody to be part of the story, saying, I love the idea of Obi-Wan having a buddy on Tatooine, like a secret buddy. So like the first time he goes into <laughs> town, you see Cody, and he's following him through the streets and attacks him, takes him into an alley with a knife to his throat and says, you're dead. And then you realize, oh, no, Cody's making a point. You know, just a little little point. Like, come on, you got to be more careful. So uh, that's the the big headline. You saw that one going around the news sphere, the Star Wars news sphere here. Cody uh, would also have been tasked with guarding Luke while Kenobi went off planet. So let's just start there and go where we want to go. Jennifer, uh, your, your, your thoughts on this pitch, this pitch of what could have been. You know, I, I don't know how I feel about this uh, this thing that he pitched right here with, you know, Cody teaching Obi-Wan a lesson. I feel like it, it's not consistent with the character of Obi-Wan that even if even if he's not totally connected to the Force, um, he still is going to sense that someone is behind him trying to attack him. I, I just and there were a lot of moments and we'll talk about them um, in this article where he's pitching all these things, which are, they sound really cool and fun. But for me. It actually goes against the the nature of some of these characters that we already know and have been established, uh, not just in the movies, but in the animated series and in the novels. And so this was one moment where I was like, mm, I don't know how I feel about that. Got it. Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying there on that. And I'll, and I'll have to admit to being... It's not just I'm so happy with what we we got in, in Kenobi. I was, but I'm still like working through Kenobi. I'm still processing it. I still just love what was there. That even some of the stuff he's pitching, I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds interesting. I, I wouldn't trade that for what we got. And I'm just in that state right. of mind right now. But the the Cody stuff, I love this character. And we're going to talk about more uh, about how he's returned. But uh, Joseph, I'll bring you into this here. Your 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 reactions, Jennifer's thoughts and, and your gut reaction to this pitch. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think uh, starting from the uh, what, what you said at the top, Ken, I think these uh, are with great power comes great responsibility type of conversations um, because I don't want to. It's easy to look at what could have been, you know, the kind of the mystery behind the door that wasn't open and go, that would have been better, you know, or yeah, that yeah. would be awesome. And and I don't want to do that kind of thing. One show is actually made. And then these were some ideas in, in early draft. <laughs> yeah. So it is uh, unfair to just sort of compare them but it is always fun to hear the ideas and i think for me the cody thing is i really like the character of cody Mm -hmm. uh so i'm sort of fascinated by this i can see this scene working if the relationship really is cody is obsessed with protecting kenobi about Mm -hmm. making things right because he feels he failed 
uh, Kenobi by yeah. giving in to Order 66. And Obi-Wan is still just sort of depressed and just like, I don't care what happens to me. I'm not paying any attention to my surroundings. Like, if that's the point, I, I get where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the idea of sort of uh, Cody as a secret buddy. <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of fun in and of itself. But the I, I think the thing that I react to is sometimes we hear an individual idea in my question is always well how does that add up to a whole what is the what was the, the main idea of this version of the story and if the main idea of this version of the story was uh what do you do after you failed to make things right mm -hmm. and you then you have obi-wan on that journey to be like i want to make things right that i failed and then yeah. cody has a different perspective on that of i feel like i failed obi-wan so uh i want to make mm -hmm. that right i can see the the thought process about how uh, both of these characters' arcs would contribute to that same theme. Mm -hmm. I think the the kind of visceral reaction I have is I do like in the story that we got that Obi-Wan is very isolated. The mm -hmm. story that we got goes on to be about Obi-Wan rediscovering connection because he doesn't have any. He can't, he can't interact with Luke. Uh, he mm -hmm. can't connect uh, to Qui-Gon. He doesn't trust anyone. He's not opening up. And it's it's really connection that opens him up. And if the story went in that direction, that Obi-Wan is, you know, deeply depressed and feels unconnected, even though he's got Cody, mm -hmm. <laughs> it really feels right. like two middle fingers to Cody. <laughs> you know, so it's always a thing for me about the isolated idea might be really cool, but how does it interact with the whole is, is mm -hmm. what's going to make the individual idea, you know, work or not. Work or not. Yeah, no, I look, and I, I, there's, there's something there with the character of Cody. Uh, and, and again, more Cody storytelling does look to be on the way. Um, I, I, I don't know, again, this is a big screen idea. And even, I don't know. I don't know if it ever would have gone to three movies. It might've been two. Who knows? But again, that's a big what if and, and who knows, but I can see how that on, on a big screen, uh, it would have been really cool. Epic, a clone. We got to deal with that. Um, I just wonder if, again, it's hard for, it's very, I, I have to be honest. It's hard for me to separate with what we did get. And what we could, because you could throw the the could haves all day, yeah. Um, and and Cody is one more piece in a series that already had a lot to do in six episodes, and I think he, we didn't even spend enough. To, I I still wish I had more time with Owen and Baru, and I just think I'd rather see Baru with a shotgun laser blaster than Cody. At this point. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if that lies with your thoughts, Jen. But yeah, I think Joseph, you make a, a great point because having somebody externally try and like, and that's what the way it seems like it was presented. Like Cody was going to kind of lift Kenobi out of his funk, right? Mm -hmm. He was going to be there like, come on, man, you know, <laughs> you've got to do this and you got to do that. What we ended and I, not to pit, put them against each other, but I liked the story of Kenobi having to find that within himself and having to lift himself from underneath those metaphoric rocks. <laughs> and he, it was his relationship to to Leia and eventually to Tala. And we had these other people kind of planting these seeds, but not so like uh, in a way of like, come on, not like a buddy going, hey, hey, man, why the down face? Let's, you know, and that could absolutely be fun. But I, I do. I'm so happy with what we God. And like you're saying, Ken, I'm satiated. My, my belly is full and now I'm getting another meal and I'm like, well, oh, I don't know if I can make room. Uh, <laughs> sounds delicious, <laughs> but I'm good. So, uh, yeah, uh, more food here at Force Center. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Food. I always bring in the food. I'm sorry. I love yeah. food. I'm, uh, we uh, all do it. I would, I would love a Cody meal, but you know, I want to yeah. make sure that the Cody meal, uh, goes with the rest of the things I'm eating, you know? Yeah. 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 And again, I, 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 when this started popping, uh, up, um, it, it, it makes me go, Ooh, okay. Like, uh, I want to be clear about that. It, it, and, and so type of thing that, I think you kind of said it, Joseph, if this had happened, movie or not, or show, it would have done what it needed to do, and that would have been the story. Um, but then you're, you're right. If, 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 if he's got that connection with, with Cody, it changes the relationship with everyone else in the story and Kenobi. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I always weigh it in trade-offs. Um, uh, what, what, we, what could we lose if this is what we got? And, and again, it all comes uh, from the mic has come down to Peru with a blaster, um, but uh, obviously a lot, lot more. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's good stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, I just feel like, and this is where these conversations go, right? Because we're trying to sort of fit yep. Cody into the story we got. But I can yep. see a different story where where what is haunting Kenobi is, you know, maybe in this version, he thought he knew Vader was out there. And he is what he's haunted by is not being alone, but that he's being more proactive about wanting to make things right with Vader. Well, then this starts to line up because then Cody needs a mission to make things right. And then protecting yeah. Luke has some like richness to it. Yep. You know, it, hmm. and that would be interesting to me, but it's a it's a totally different story. Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, it is. And hey, we're not done necessarily done with Cody. Cody looks to be, uh, you know, appearing in Bad Batch season two uh, based on that trailer and the excitement we got around Star Wars Celebration. Um, but and what is interesting uh, about spending more time with Kenobi's clone pal? I wouldn't call him his best pal, but his, his clone pal. <laughs> uh, what do we want to learn from him? Is that some of the stuff that has uh, been you know, is being presented in this big, uh, uh, what if, uh, and we want to, do we want to see any of that kind of carry over to stuff with bad batch, Joseph? Yeah, absolutely. I really like Cody, but I always wanted to spend a little bit more time on him and, and focus on him a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I don't know if bad batch, uh, will do that, but I would love that. I, I would love to see, uh, once, uh, Cody has the inhibitor chip removed, uh, how does he feel? Do you have a little bit of the story that was in this early draft of Obi-Wan Kenobi where, he believes uh, Kenobi would have found a way to survive. We didn't find his body. That means that mm -hmm. means old old Jedi Master Kenobi is alive. You know, so does yeah. Cody think there's a chance to set things right, or does he not want to stir up trouble by going uh, to look for him? I mm -hmm. also think like one of the things that we got with Cody is Cody and Rex were both kind of held up in the Clone Wars animated series as you know reliable, uh, intuitive in sync with their masters but one of the ways that cody was in sync with kenobi is unlike rex and anakin who are a little bit more like fly by the seat of our pants find a way cody's a little bit more rigid right he's mm -hmm. a little bit more the the letter of the law the same way kenobi can be in contrast to anakin yeah so i'd be fascinated from that perspective of he was such a loyalist to the republic and to the army you know does he how does that make him feel about being used for a fake war you know uh, how does he react based on the fact that he was a little bit more sort of strict and rigid, you know? Yeah. How, how do the, the, the rules you follow, uh, you suddenly find out, you know, maybe you shouldn't have, or, you know, like you said, a, a pawn in a bigger plan. That's fascinating. And again, Cody being one that kind of shot, you know, Kenobi out of the sky, it's, uh, yep. living with that is pretty interesting. <laughs> Pretty interesting. And, and it keeps in line that, you know, with the, I think there's a lot of that kind of legend stuff of, of Cody sticking on and, and training a little bit like Panaka in that way of, of suddenly you find yourself far down this path and, and can he reverse that there? So I'm excited to play with those big themes. Um, you're right. He is, and he's a little bit of the forgotten superstar uh, clone, you know, Rex takes the lead <laughs> in the Clone Wars series and still going strong. And we love Rex around these parts and, and, and the Star Wars fandom. Uh, uh, he's got that great big bushy beard now, and I love it so much. Uh, but yeah, Jen, a little more time with Cody, you know, give him a, his day in the spotlight. Yeah, and and I think to Joseph's point, it, it it is interesting. How does this person who was very practical and strategic, um, how do they now fit? And if they're and if he's deciding not to be a part of the order of the empire and he is wanting to fight alongside the freedom fighters or the people of the path, like why? What was what was was there one pivotal moment? Was it the allegiance his allegiance to the Jedi? Like I guess mm. that could be something interesting that could be explored in season two of Kenobi if they bring him in. I don't know. Um, but I think with such yeah. a with such a character like Cody, who is really beloved in the in the fandom. Um, if he is in season two, they're they're going to have to have some of that backstory, I think, or explain mm. it somewhere, whether it's Bad Batch or a novel. I don't know, something, mm. because I think that just having like one line like, yeah, I no longer have my inhibitor chip. I'm, I'm here. Uh, that that mm. will be enough to satisfy fans. I, and again, a lot of. You know, we always can joke about being in the bubble, but I think a lot of folks would be like, "Now, what? Nate, what now? That's the '66 thing that made them do that. They got, they got it out. Well, there was a chip, yeah, right. <laughs> That's the whole the reality exactly, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. To the to the non Star Wars fans, they're going to be like, "Wait, what's going on? I don't understand." So, yeah, um, mm -hmm. but that's, yeah. You put that, <laughs> that's yeah. why I'm not a writer, <laughs> screenwriter at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What about you, Ken? What are you excited about with uh, Cody in, in Bad Batch? 
Um, I is again. Uh, I love the the ang- angle of a of a rule follower. One uh, of uh, you know, I'm one of those as well. So suddenly, you know, I, I try to follow. I even go out of my way to cross streets at lights. All right. Um, Me too. Made, yeah, I get made fun of by a lot of my friends there. I don't I don't run across. Um, yeah, but what, what do you do in that timeline? And then seeing the, the the clones, seeing the Bad Batch who have broken away from that. I'm curious to see if they're gonna how much they are gonna pull in of, of some of the Cody uh, legend stuff. Um, if, if he's already part of the fight, if he's uh, debating and do we get some of those beats uh, and then just, is he, cause he doesn't strike me as uh, being completely disconnected from what's going on. It's still so fresh. Um, so I want to see how he processes it um, as, as someone you're talking about um, as a role follower. But again, I dealing with, um, I would love in bad batch for him to say the name Kenobi or talk about what was done uh, in a little bit more detail um, and how he got past it. And how he's uh, processing his part in it. That's a great way to look at it. And then again, just to have uh, a little more, a uh, little more insight into the events of Revenge of the Sith and another Star Wars story is always cool for me. Yeah, I think it might be a way to to have a fresh in to this story that we've now in the animated mm-hmm. world seen a decent amount with uh, yeah. various clones. We've seen the ones who've broken free and realize mm-hmm. that they've been manipulated and used. And if if Cody doesn't get the inhibitor chip out. It would be interesting to have a clone where their perspective, their relationship is, uh, I'm I'm still doing what I've always done. I'm following orders. But I also have this baggage of I'm extra angry at Kenobi in the Jedi. Mm. They betrayed it. You know, I'm right. angry at Kenobi. I want to find Kenobi mm. because he's the one who did did me wrong. If yeah. he's still got the inhibitor chip in, that might be an interesting angle as well. Mm-hmm. Could be. Could be. Uh, Jen, any final Cody thoughts before we move on? Uh. No, I I like the idea of Cody uh, yeah. going back to you know being in, in uh, maybe season two of Obi Wan Kenobi. I like the idea. I don't know how you can make it work. Um, I like a lot of the ideas uh, that Stuart Beatty presented in mm-hmm. his in his draft. I think that there was a lot of fun things. Although I will say that I do have a bone to pick about the the drunk Jawa thing. I, I don't know if that's necessarily <laughs> that feels a little bit more Marvel for me than Star Wars. Um, funny bit, but. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, there, there was a lot, a lot of, yeah, you, you're talking about this, uh, local Sarlacc pit kind of storyline where they're, everyone's going out there to dump bodies. Uh, yes. and look again, uh, this is a guy who, who wrote collateral, one of my, my favorite movies. So I, I, mm-hmm, I'm here to trust yeah. him. Um, <clears throat> that is one I would have seen. That's great. It it, it did uh, it did seem like a lot. I'd rather we have Tika than some uh, random uh, drunk job. Or maybe it was Tika. Uh, maybe it maybe was. Tika's got some a darker side we haven't seen yet. Uh, yeah, I don't know the way he pitched it. Uh, it was one of those. I don't know. Maybe he had to be there because <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> it was funny. a little pulp fictiony. I don't know. Like, uh, but yeah, I was like, well, I don't yeah. know if that really fits uh, with. Uh, Star Wars per se. Yeah, I missed this uh, this detail. The a drunk Jawa was throwing bodies into a sarlacc. It's it's <laughs> deeper in this direct article. And again, I I I, mm. I went for, I, the headline was Cody, right? So I'm like, all right, let's pull yeah. out the Cody stuff. And I'm like, oh, he's talk. Oh, he's talking about all of it. Yeah, basically, he and Cody have to, you know, kill. Sounds like they kill some stormtroopers and they have to bury the bodies. So they t- <laughs> they carry him out to a sarlacc nearby and, and feed them in. in. Yeah, but everyone else in the community is doing the same thing. Including a drunk Jawa that shows up, uh, kind of. You know, I don't know if I'm missing all the beats there, Jen. But no, um, that's right. That's right. And I, I just is so wild. And I was like, I love <laughs> wild Star Wars. But whoa, this is really uh, this is wild. Yeah, so, again, I'm not, I'm not even criticizing. It, it might have worked on, especially on the big yeah. screen. Get that? I mean, I love the Sarlacc sequence go, at Boba Fett. Yeah, it was just. Yeah, it was like. Um, It'd be funny. I don't know. I, what about? I'd rather learn more about Leia. <laughs> <laughs> this. Right, but, but it was uh, it was something uh, something we hadn't seen in Star Wars before. I'll say that. That's yeah, wow. Sure. Uh, I really, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. I'm also just fascinated by like we we've all seen the jokes, or I'm sure you've had the experience of like trying to explain a movie to your friend in the way you explain it. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> does not capture what it was about. I kind of like the picture of Obi Wan being like, I don't really like this life where I'm living <laughs> yeah. on a planet where just. Everybody's kind of casual uh, late in the afternoon activities are dump your bodies. <laughs> <laughs> Bring out your dead. Oh. Yeah. Bring out your dead and toss them in the Sarlacc. This is not the life I wanted, thinks Obi Wan. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. It feels very officey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Push into, into Obi Wan just shaking his head. 
the drunk Jawa throws the body in, <laughs> takes a chug, and Obi-Wan looks directly at the camera and sighs. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, my God. That's amazing. All right, yo, there you go. Breaking news for Joseph here. The Sarlacc, uh, another another Sarlacc, but a bunch of bodies. <laughs> and a drunk, drunk Jawa. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just such a fan of Tika. I got to get that. I might get that Black Series figure they announced last week. Yeah. Uh, just mm. add it to the storage, but I get it. Though. <laughs> All right. We are, uh, we are not done talking about Kenobi in the second half of the show. We're going to follow up with some of the other uh, revelations uh, uh, that Stuart Beatty had of, around uh, the character of Reva. Before we get to that, I want to uh, give you our four center recommends an audio book. We think you should try out on us. Joseph dealer's choice. What do you want? What do you got? You know what? Why not, too? Uh, we're going to continue to recommend Leia, Princess of Aldron by Claudia Gray, because it's just a great follow-up if you enjoyed little Leia in the Obi-Wan Kenobi television show. And also the book that Ken and I are reading right now, Shadow of the Sith by Adam Christopher. Uh, just crack that open on the beach. A nice beach read with the sand attacking me. Uh, <laughs> but I'm enjoying the book very much. So uh, if you want to listen to either of those, we recommend it. Absolutely. To download your free audio book today, go to audibletrial.com slash four center. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash four center for your free audio book. Get a book on us and help the show in the process. All right. We're going to take a break, throw our stormtroopers in the Sarlacc pit and come back with some more news here on four center. Welcome back to Force Center, the big show, the main show, the superstar store of our news fleet. We are here today talking Star Wars news, and a lot of it is uh, what could have been, what ifs, maybe would have, should have, could have, or just uh, some un- fun information from a version of the story that we will never get. Stuart Beatty just, he just keeps talking. This article with the direct, it's great. It just keeps, he keeps going. Um, <laughs> and God bless him. God bless him for it. I talk, if I wrote a Kenobi movie, I would, and no one saw it, I would tell everyone. I'd be at the bar down the street. <laughs> like, and then, and then the drunk Jawa does this. Um, but this was actually, I thought, a, a pretty a big reveal. It was, uh, at least to me here, I'll see what you all think here. It was revealed that the third sister, Reva, was an original creation of Beatty's. And it was uh, the only planned Inquisitor to appear in his version. Going into some of the details here, but I will stop there for a second. I know there's something about that I really liked that uh, this is something that was developed, uh, you know, what, 2016, 2017, when they're sitting down working on it. The fact that this kind of the character existed then uh, and mm. that uh, it wasn't uh, all right. We got to expand the show. Right. We got to we okay. got to throw something in there. There's still some kind of the same. He talks about some same principles of you know Vader and Kenobi. It's all about that. But we we do know. Uh, kind of the results so to speak we don't know the emotions we don't know the beats into it but that having this other character would be valuable to the story so it just made a lot of sense i don't know it just made me even uh love the presence of reva more in the show uh, if um i don't know if that, i don't know if that makes sense jen but that's that's kind of where i first went on that yeah no absolutely this i think that there you know there's a, a portion of the fans that felt like she was just shoehorned in her character was shoehorned in. no she was absolutely planned and this has been she was an integral part since the beginning mm-hmm. and i and i like that he shared that and i and i love the character that he that he created so mm-hmm. Yeah, and a, lot, a lot of the backstory is similar, and and he admits that they go in the interview there. He admits that it's uh, yeah, it ends up being very similar to the second sister from Fallen Order. And he's like, look, that was I I'm in my corner doing my stuff, and this, and then the game comes out, and I play it, and wow, cool, kind of similar stuff. But also, I think that's that's not um, that's not a, a problem to me because a lot of these dark siders suffer from the same kind of traumas and the same kind of uh, problems uh, uh, w- that arise from those and how to process and how to move forward, how to make those choices. I, I, th- I think you're almost supposed to have similar beats in the villains uh, in Star mm-hmm. Wars, at, at least to mm-hmm. me. Um, Joseph, any, any gut reaction to uh, Reva being around? Yeah, no, I really liked uh, some of the clarity and the, of where Reva started and where Reva ended up. And again, much like with the Cody thing, of how you know characters are a piece of a narrative right uh and they have to serve the overall ideas and and themes of that story uh i also looked up the jawa thing and am mildly distracted (laughs) i'm sorry (laughs) sorry uh we'll get we'll get back to it uh and he's drunk burping and wasted and i called him bad jawa Right, bad Jawa. Oh. Uh, sorry, we'll get back to Reva. I do think okay. this is charming, right? Because mm. we're we're, we're mm-hmm. having serious conversations about the the differences, but really the way this interview is conducted, it really is like Stuart Beatty's, 
your friend you met at the mm. bar and you're just like, hey, could you just tell me about it? Can you, tell, <laughs> can you remember your favorite scene? Yeah. Oh, and there was this bit and I like this bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, okay. I'm with you. All right. All right. It's, I'm back. There's a, lot to, I, there's a lot to process. I mean, this is our, our reaction to the story. Like, again, I, 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 during like Tuesday through Friday, I kind of half pay attention to Star Wars news. Like sometimes yeah. it pops up, I'll see, and I have a lot of the words muted still, but our Discord server, a lot of folks, uh, our Force Center friends post stories. And so I go, oh, that's cool. And I don't dig in. And so I dig in over the weekend to get ready for the show. I was like, oh, Commander, what? There's a drunk Jawa? What's happening here? I'm with yeah, you. no, there. Are, yeah, okay, yeah, about the uh, refugees with a different religion. Wow, yeah, yeah. That's well, you're right. right. That's, cool. that's like that's a cool. whole other yeah thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. That was like, yes. uh, it's cool. It was uh, again. Uh, he's got a lot of good good things that I'm like, cool. It's just that would have really been something different. And so that's what you're. Uh, that's your win. That's what you're. Yeah. Okay. At. So I see he's there. There is a lot more in this Cody article. Yeah. yeah. I, mm. I I uh, read the headline and I I don't know. I think I must have stopped at an ad. Uh, and thought that the interview was over and he goes into all of this structure stuff and what was similar and what was different. Uh, yeah, you read the Cody stuff, ordered a table from Wayfair and called it a day. <laughs> exactly. The ads got me. I accidentally clicked and now I have to get a different apartment that fits this furniture. Uh, okay, anyway, so getting back to, to Riva, um, I, I think he says some really interesting things that to mm -hmm. me is like... Uh, what you were saying, like, yeah, he didn't realize that a very similar arc was being created for the character of Trilla in mm -hmm. Fallen Order. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that. And I think what's really interesting to me is I think he describes Riva the way that I think maybe a lot of us assumed an Inquisitor might function mm -hmm. within an Obi-Wan Kenobi show, which is definitely a character with an arc, but a little bit more fulfilling um, plot needs and a little bit more serving obi wan story right mm -hmm. so there's this quote here where he says and so reva was my attempt to give him obi-wan someone to defeat or someone to save because he's not going to save darth the darth vader storyline is going to end in a downer so i wanted to save someone and that's why i created reva so yeah mm -hmm. if you're just looking at it on paper uh, an inquisitor who is new who doesn't have any canon obligations is mm -hmm. somebody who uh, can give Obi-Wan a victory, either in combat or morally from saving. Mm -hmm. And I think we discussed it on the podcast, and I kind of thought that would be the way it might go. And then when some of those interviews came out, that that, that first, you know, news dump yeah. uh, where they were, um, I can't even remember which, uh, which you know, trade publication that was, yeah. uh, you know, where they really focused on Riva, and we had a big conversation about what like, wow, Riva's her own character with her own arc. She's not an obstacle mm -hmm. for Obi Wan, and I think that is really the the pivot point. It's not about good or bad. It's about how the character interacts with the story, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I feel like the choice for the story that we got is to zero in on these themes of trauma and of mentors failing children to go. Yeah what would what would haunt obi-wan not just anakin but what does the fall of the jedi represent which is the failing children failing uh the next generation and so reva still i think as a character does interact with obi-wan and serves this this massive uh, uh theme but then she is given truly her own arc like you could tell this story completely from her perspective with her as the main character Mm -hmm. And it would still work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, the the character as imagined in the Stuart Beatty version would be great and and fun and have an arc a, as he's describing. But in the version that we got, I think they managed to freshen up some of the the villain ideas, right? Um, mm -hmm. She is a villain doing awful, misguided things, uh, but we get to really emotionally feel her understandable point of trauma. Yeah, and you know we get to see her not ultimately be saved or stopped by Kenobi, right? Right. She gets to that cave and she has a breakthrough, right? And, and sees herself in Luke's place and she makes that choice. But then you still have Kenobi making a difference because he comes in and, and they bond over mm -hmm. getting over their trauma. So, so they are still connected. Uh, mm -hmm. Kenobi does, he kind of saves her is in, he, he gets her back up on her feet and encourages her to continue with her life, which is the journey he's gone through. So they are connected, but it yeah. is just much more her own mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, even even down to some of the little details, and I'll bring you here, Jen, in on this uh, conversation. But uh, uh, you know, he's got these little details in the pitch. There are differences, including her learning about Anakin becoming Vader from Kenobi, and then her dying at the hands of Vader after saying uh, she killed Kenobi, uh, and, and maybe kind of trying to line some things up there. You know, to any can of questions you might have, is the way I kind of took that as well as part of the story. Um, so yeah, again, we're not trying to do the old compare and contrast game. Um, Jen, what do you th- what's your thoughts here on 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 the Reva stuff here? Uh, and as as uh, Joseph saying, uh, you know, uh, got a little bit more complete version at least, you know, because we got a complete show versus an incomplete movie, of course. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Joseph, you put it so well because my my visceral reaction when I when I read this was I went, oh no, well this would have been very typical of what we see with particularly women characters um in these stories is that their all their sole purpose is really to set up the the hero right mm-hmm. and her story would have been complete she would have died uh they would have created this incredibly cool character and then she would have been her story would have been over at the end of this series and that would have been very disappointing um and uh and so i'm glad that mm-hmm. they gave this character depth her own agency her own storyline, like you're saying, Joseph, that it could have been, we could have a whole story told from her point of view. There's just so much going on. And she's also not just kind of the stereotypical villain, which would have been predictable. Um, so many twists, uh, not just in, in the plot and her story, but in the acting that she was able to bring to her performance, uh, Moses Ingram. And so, yeah, it, 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 like you're, you're putting it very nicely, Joseph, it freshened it up. You know, but but really, I mean, it's this character is is really important and it would have been a tragedy, in my opinion, if if it had been presented this way, where basically her sole purpose was so that Kenobi could save someone. So it's not even about her. It's about him. And I, and I'm sure that that was not intentional. Like, I'm going to bring in the woman character and she's not going to have oh, any. Yeah. Just, you know, that's not it at all. But I think that. That's why it's important to bring on different writers that, and, and have maybe uh, uh, just having more voices, right? Saying, hmm, what if we did this? And how about this? And then you get this really fully uh, realized character um, that has so many things that, that we can all identify with and relate to. And so, yeah, yeah, that's how I felt about that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No. I think it might be one of the great gifts of it becoming a television show that there is literal room on the page for it, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. This is the challenge. Like, I, I love Solo. It is not only one of my favorite Star Wars movies. It's one of my favorite movies, period. Uh, but one of the things that's hard about it is every character is in there to serve Solo. And then mm-hmm. you run into some of those moments where, you know, we, we end uh, the movie and we're all pining for more of Enfys Nest and more of Kira and wrestling with Val and L3's fate. And right. some of that is because you have limited space and everyone is serving Han Solo's story, which mm-hmm. is a normal way to tell a story when you have a main character that you're trying to kind of define and mm-hmm. the limited space of right. a movie. So I think Riva is is a, a in the television show to me is a success of your saying of uh, more writers, more creators, more perspective, but also of expanding the story and allowing room for a character to have a really full and different arc because her story relates to and informs Kenobi, uh, but it is not there only to define Kenobi. Yeah, and look, yeah, and, yeah. Oh, so Jen, go ahead, please. No, no, and it just makes me think about even like Tala, like. She, in some ways, she kind of also serves a purpose for Kenobi, right? She helps him, like, kind of get reinvigorated to fight. She reminds him about hope and things like that. But even still, she still is her own character. They still give her a lot of agency. And so I feel like there is a way to do that without making – is it that thing that – what do they say? Fridged? Is that is that true? Is that yeah. applicable? Um yeah, where they these characters, these female characters, can still have their own storylines and still serve the overall plot and and the hero. There's just a way to do it, but yeah, mm-hmm. yeah and the, I think that this show mm-hmm. nailed it. The current Kenobi, yeah, no, the, uh, <laughs> and, and that's the benefit of uh, more time in the story. Maybe uh, the, the the story being developed a couple years after uh, you know the, the original movie um, I think the demands of the audiences have have, have grown and, and and matured even in the last couple of years right where we're having these mm-hmm. kind of conversations you're right and look Stuart, right. Stuart Beatty's talking about 
uh, a half cooked idea at this point. It, it, it wasn't even, didn't even get to the kitchen and, and who knows where they end up with it. And yeah, like what Joseph's saying, this is kind of traditional storytelling in a way. And, and, and you got to analyze that now and you got to ask why, and, and you, it can still be impactful with Tala. Like I, I, I still say, it's, you know, it's okay. It's possible for characters to die and have great purpose behind that, but you, you continue to analyze why you, why you need to do that and, and why you should do that or why you, you know, you should. And, 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 and I think they, they, had, they just had a different perspective on Reva now because they were able to, and it ended in a much more, um, I don't know, just more, not just an uh, important way for me. Uh, her story is very important and the open ending aspect of it is, uh, is, is tremendously valuable uh, going mm-hmm. forward in Star Wars versus just being an ending. And now we have to go back to the beginning and, and a prequel Reva story, you know? Right. Yeah, no, her her story continuing is is one of the great uh, gifts I think of the Obi-Wan Kenobi show. Um, mm-hmm. I did I did like uh, so we keep talking about like uh how do how do the individual ideas fit into the whole? And mm-hmm. I think that's where these conversations get interesting is like I, I can like an individual idea but then wonder how it would fit in the the whole of the show that was created. Mm-hmm. As an individual idea, I do like the idea of a of a villain uh, the way he's describing Riva's uh, perspective in this movie version, where mm. he says, uh, so in her mind, the Jedi Council were the biggest villains in the galaxy. She believed the lies that they were plotting a coup to overtake and get power and all that, but they were stopped by the clones. So she mm. believed that's why she's hunting Jedi, because she believed the Jedi are the worst, basically. Like yeah. that individual idea of picking up on that thread that Palpatine lied, and, and it's it's not just that uh, people don't sit, talk about Jedi because they're, afraid of speaking out or because Mm -hmm. uh you know they're gonna be hunted by the empire and all that or they just forgot them it's that he successfully sold the lie that they Mm -hmm. were traitors so the idea of having somebody Mm -hmm. who really believes this this is a guiding truth that they tried to take power that's fascinating because that's a great sith lie of like Mm -hmm. they're all like us everybody's just out for themselves it's just that the jedi used to lie about it so right. I, I do love that idea. I don't think it quite fit into the version of Obi-Wan Kenobi we got, but I do like mm-hmm. it as an individual idea and I'd yeah. love some storytelling that follows up on people who truly believe that lie. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's something you could get into, you know, uh, going back to even Cody and the Bad Batch. I don't, you know, who knows what he mm. what he's dealing with or people yeah. around him. No, that's interesting stuff. And again, it, and it speaks to just a lot of the, you know, the big lie that Palpatine's put out there and, and down to the propaganda posters with his, uh, you know, pretty young face on it versus the decrepit <laughs> evil wizard monster. Uh, in closing this conversation about uh, Reva, what do we love about the journey uh, of Reva as depicted on the show? What are some of the things we're, 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 what's sitting with us right now about this character and the potential, if, if at all, if, if, if they take it to go forward? Jennifer. Mm, Well, I love how complicated she is and I love how her choices are complicated and yet I can understand why she is doing what she's doing. I understand why she wants justice for her trauma, just how she's going about doing it that I I don't necessarily agree, but I can I can empathize (laughs) with with how she's feeling. And I think that that's something interesting from a villain. It's why I loved Kylo Ren. Uh, for kind of the same reasons. And I think that they're really uh, modern takes on what a villain is, right? It's, yeah. it's more real world because in our world, things aren't just, aren't just black and white. And so I think that that's what she represents. Um, I loved the twist that she wasn't hunting Vader. That she, I mean, that she wasn't uh, serving Vader. She was hunting him. I think it's a really important twist. That scene with her and Obi Wan, the doorway is. I, I'd like just. Mm. I just go back to it, just because I, it's just such good acting. It's such good storytelling. I just. I love watching it. Do you ever have those scenes where we just like you just want to watch that one scene mm-hmm. just because it, it makes you feel so, makes me feel something, man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it really does. So yeah, I just. Uh, she's such a great character. She's she's cool she's interesting um and i i really am curious to see what they do with the character next whether it's a novel season two who knows right yeah yeah who knows indeed yeah joseph yeah no i mean i i love everything you're saying i we, i love that doorway scene as well so many great beats in it and i think reva being really really honest i think it, it, there's so much so many things that i like about her character that i feel like uh, that that's her truth that she is mm-hmm. you know determined and wants to get to the point and like that she's a little bit like anakin that way and probably would have been that way if the order 66 never happened if mace had 
<laughs> taken mm-hmm. out Sidious, she probably would have grown up to be a little bit of that kind of a Jedi and that kind of a person, right? Who just pushes mm-hmm. forward and need, needs answers. Uh, so I'd like that there's kind of a, a to me, a full character uh, within uh, all uh, being tortured by the dark side. But I think my biggest thing is uh, I, I like the idea of that, that uh, of, a, of an inquisitor who believed the Jedi to believe Palpatine's mm-hmm. lie about the Jedi. But what's really unique about Riva is a villain who is dealing with the truth. Um, a lot of times when we see a villain, uh, particularly in Star Wars, they're sort of warped into believing something that's half true, right? Oh, that's in it, order yeah. to justify their behavior. Um, Anakin does it immediately. Um, mm-hmm. We see that with uh, Ben Kylo, where deep down he knows that his mom didn't really reject him and that his dad didn't really reject him. He he knows deep down that, you know, Luke actually wasn't going to cut him down, but he blames them and he lives on that lie to justify his behavior. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rivas is character kind of got to see the truth to see Anakin did this, this horrible thing. And the Jedi who should have been there to protect me, to stop him. They weren't there. They let this happen somehow. Right. Um, so she's making bad choices <laughs> to, to continue down this path of vengeance, but she's doing it with pretty honest facts, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what makes her story really rich and her interaction with Kenobi really rich because that's what Kenobi's wrestling with of like, you're not doing this on, you're not lying to yourself the way Anakin is. You have an accurate assessment. I agree with you. I failed you. How How the hell are we both going to move on from that and, and that's what i think makes their scene together so so beautiful of obi-wan i think truly feels guilty that mm-hmm. that he failed her but i think they're and she feels guilty that she failed her other uh you know younglings that she much like anakin she should have had enough power to stop that you know right. and if i get this power I'll, I'll be able to stop all bad things from happening and that that scene between them when she's breaking down it, it really is this very uh, cathartic, you know, sometimes bad things happen and we can't stop them. And maybe we even should have been able to, but we, we can't, and we have to be able to let go that we can't control everything and, and find a way forward. And I think all of that kind of stems from uh, Riva being a character who's not making great choices, but dealing with the truth rather than lying to herself. Mm. Yeah, you both have used the word like understandable or uh, this this concept you're talking about, Joseph, about the truth. I, I really enjoy that about the character of I always I always seem to throw out that caveat when discussing it of like, look, in real life, it's not that easy. Da, da, da. All I'm saying <laughs> is it, that, that it's presented in such an understandable way where you're looking at her her story and, and with the way she describes, you know, Anakin walks in and you're like, yay, the Calvary's here. And instead, he's mm. just wiping everyone out in front of you. That really resonated with me. Uh, and and I'm sure it did for a lot of folks. And and again, yeah, I'll, I'll, the, uh, me three. That doorway scene is is one of the best <laughs> in a few years here in Star Wars and, and an all timer. Um, so yeah, to to take that story and just um, um, deal with that going forward. It, you, the way you talk about the truth, jo- Joseph, is is um, it's just well said. A big force center, well said on that. And and how uh, she breaks it it, 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 she breaks through on her own here in a way again going back to this conversation she's not just Mm -hmm. here to serve kenobi and i think kenobi has an effect on her absolutely but i I love that it it it, the the breaking of the of the cycle of violence we talk about um happens from her it's her choice because of what's in front of her and i I just uh love that i think there's great value in all that stuff and on top of that yeah i think it's a great design and a cool character that doesn't hurt (laughs) yeah yeah i mean speaking of the doorway scene how much obi-wan does you know, he does such an Obi-Wan thing of like, I want to understand her point of view. I yeah. know she has a different one and I don't understand what, you know, it's, it's, it's stalling, but it's also like, I want to know what you really think in all that sort of, um, we can do this together. We can make a difference together. What do you want? I, I think that is a connection and I think it does help Riva. Uh, but I like that Riva is alone when she makes the better choice. But I think there is an argument that Kenobi did have an impact on her there. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, abs- absolutely, absolutely. Um, it just, and I, I love that you, you're saying, you know, Kenobi kind of going, hold on, let me hear, let me, let me hear what you're saying. Let me try to get there. Um, yeah, yeah, it isn't, uh, it isn't just simply simple blind rage with Reva to me. Um, mm-hmm. No, 
eyes wide open rage. <laughs> so there, there you go, Ken. Uh, you do such a great job of uh, encapsulating what we're talking about into uh, a, a simple idea one can hold and put on a T-shirt. Open-eyed rage. Open. That's what Reva has. You know why? Because that's all I understand are bumper stickers. It's all I understand. Uh, but that's that. You should be running political campaigns, Ken. You're very good at it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm choking on the politics the politics of it all. No, actually, that'd be kind of fun. <laughs> that'd be kind of fun. Is is it just like Veep? Then I'm all on board. If it's just like the show, <laughs> uh, that's what I, that's what I want. Uh, no, this has been a lot of fun. And look, I, I want to be clear. Like I, we we all are enjoying a lot of Stuart Stuart Beatty's ideas. Uh, it's just you know uh, it, you can't help but do a con- contrast and compare. And uh, you know you don't want to, but I'm just I I just. This conversation or even alone is why I like um, what they've uh, given us in the Kenobi show uh, and why I just think there's a lot to still process in it and a lot to look in and dig into. Um, and it's kind of fun. But also, you know, these are fun ideas from a very creative person who had his hands on the script. And you also can feel that energy of I was this close. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was mine. And, uh, you know, his name is still on the on the show because of things like this. Reva in his creation so maybe one day we'll get the uh direct interview with hussein amini to hear more of uh, uh what he put into the story if he can uh say uh and all yeah that i mean things. that was my last thing i was fascinated by that vader was in this first draft right mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so did did vader disappear in the hussein amini uh version or when deborah chow gave those great quotes about being encouraged to swing for the fences was that not about vader but rather about leia yeah oh. yeah yeah, and how and how far are you going to take that story? Yeah, no, love it. Good point. Good mm-hmm. point. I'm telling you what, you know, I don't, I don't. They haven't announced officially the Disney Gallery, and I don't think we'll get this kind of information in it. So we will need a tell-all book <laughs> on the making of Kenobi for the writers' <laughs> credits. All right, that's our look at Star Wars news. Before we get out of here, we always like to uh, take a look at this week in Star Wars history, looking ahead to Star Wars past. And on July 9th, 1955, that's right, at the end of this week, we're celebrating a birthday. Jimmy Smits was born. Uh, Thanks to his portrayal of Senator Bail Organa in Attack the Clones, the former Pee Wee's Playhouse actor, I mean, L.A. Law actor, and yes, NYPD (laughs) Blue, but... L.A. Law is what I first uh, remember really hearing his name. Though was a big fan of Pee-wee's Playhouse. I forgot he was in the show. Uh, he has been a key part of the Star Wars family since Attack of the Clones. Though Smiths actually returned for the role uh, for the Force Unleashed video game series. And the, and the character, of course, as we know, was key throughout the Clone Wars series. It was 2016's Rogue One that brought Jimmy back into the role in a major way. And he hasn't left, which I love. What do we love about his performance of this integral, inte- integral I can't even read my own words, part of the Rebellion against the empire jen oh jimmy smith uh, you know he was he, he was huge on on la law that's when i got introduced right. to him yeah la law and it was a big deal for me as a kid because i was like wow this is this is a latino actor on prime time who's playing a lawyer like not a stereotypical character like that was a really big deal um and that he was so embraced. I was like, oh, wow, maybe I can do this, this acting thing <laughs> that I want to be doing. Yeah. Um, and then when he got cast in the prequels, I remember I was like, what? Latino <laughs> in space? Okay. Like, things are getting good. Um, so the fact that we got him back, not just in Rogue One. I mean, that was a wonderful appearance. But it, uh, we got to see more of Bail Organa in Kenobi was really special because – as an actor, they gave him a lot to work with. Mm. And and he just took that and made me love this character even more. His relationship with, with young Leia was so tender, so special. Something that I feel like we haven't really seen in Star Wars before. And with, with Brea as well. And like their relationship, this very loving, supportive relationship. Um, and getting to see these different sides of him. Um, you know, we know he's very stoic, he's very outspoken, he's a senator, but also this very tender side, um, I think was really, really beautiful. And then also the desperation of him trying to find Leia, but he's he's masking that desperation with the, still this kind of like this, you know, dignified front. Mm-hmm. But you can see his pain, his his suffering underneath that beautiful, beautiful nuanced performance by Jimmy Smith. Um, he is he's a legend, and I'm just so happy that I, I hope we get to see more of him. With the Young Leia series that I'm, I'm green lighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or even and or uh, seasons one and two. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, uh, uh, kick it to you here in a second, Joseph. But I, you know, so much of what you're saying about the the Jimmy Smiths, uh, just the the him and Attack the Clones. It was like 
you know, again, I know, I know NYPD blue became the show, but it's so funny. Yeah. I just like, it's LA law. That was on in my house a lot. You know, him, Mine Harry too. Hamlin, a lot of those guys. Oh so my it was gosh, like, Harry Hamlin. Harry Hamlin. It was like, yes. oh my gosh, uh, Jimmy Smith's in Star Wars. So, um, and I love uh, you sharing your, your real, uh, you know, your perspective on, on, on just seeing him in Star Wars and what that meant to you in terms of representation. It's powerful. I love, and there's so many moments uh, that I love of, of him as Bale in, in, in the Kenobi series and rewatching a lot this weekend. The, the moment where we at post cousin uh, when, when she burns the cousin and he's trying to, and there's that little <laughs> moment when he, and, and, and you can tell it's just such an acting moment. Uh, you know, of uh, uh, where he's trying to get her to apologize and he kind of, he has the hand, he's not really saying anything. It almost like either he takes a beat that maybe wasn't in the script. It was just this wonderful, like, you know, we apologize. I just, it's such a real moment. It's such a great moment. It, and, and he just brings that kind of stuff there. Uh, Joseph, your thoughts on Jimmy Smith and Star Wars. Yeah, I think this is a, a generational thing. I enjoyed him on NYPD Blue, but Jimmy Smith's will always be from L.A. Law to me. Just I remember. Job. I don't know why I was allowed to watch that, but I remember being yeah, like, right? this show is full of sexy time. This is this <laughs> show is my sex ed. Right, OK, great. They can they can show me some pamphlets in school. But this is where I'm getting my real education. Watching oh my gosh. <laughs> Corbin Burnson. And- Corbin Burnson. Burnson. Oh man. Jimmy Smith's just smolder across the screen. Oh wow. Yeah, it's so, yeah no, it's it is a big deal. I want to go rewatch an episode. I'm sure it will be comically <laughs> dated. Yeah. 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 Even even when Burnson showed up in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, I was like, LA Law. And I, you know, again, I'm a major league <laughs> fan. There's always it's LA Law. Kids, it's LA Law. Right. It's LA Law. And Jimmy Smith has been in a season of Dexter. He was yeah. in the weird 24 oh. uh, reboot attempt, 24 Legacy, and oh. the they mm-hmm. they it, that that show just cast a bunch of great actors and like do something with this and he yeah. tried he um but yeah his role i was always so happy to have him in star wars I remember being thrilled because I, I could not describe to you a single scene even though growing up with la law i, I can't describe yeah. a single scene i just <laughs> my emotional reaction was like that's a great actor with like gravy toss mm. he's gonna be bail or gonna that's awesome um, and then loving all of his little choices that that he makes, he, I, I think that's it. He, he's he's such a great actor. He makes lots of little choices that just you know ring out. The mm-hmm. even if they're directed, there he he you know he executes them so well. The little mm-hmm. the sad fist pound at the end yeah. of Attack the Clones <laughs> yeah. on the rail that I know I know Ken is a mm-hmm. big fan of as well. Um, the and so it is in Revenge of the Sith, you know. All, all these great actor choices, but I think the reason that he's so powerful to me as Bail Organa is he just really embodies a solid, virtuous, kind man. Mm-hmm. He he embodies a man who knows that kindness is a strength, not a weakness. Mm-hmm. Um, he reminds me, like in my soul, of my fourth grade teacher, Mister File. Um, who was one of those teachers who like saw me uh, like mm. uh, I was going through various hard times, you know, honestly being teased and all these kind of other things. And Mr. File would like pull me aside and say, like, they don't see you yet, but but people will see your value. Don't mm. worry. Oh. It will happen. Like that's Bail Organa, <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. Uh, to me. And I feel like that's just like he takes risks. He does what he needs to. He's solid. He's strong. But it's all built on kindness. Yeah. Even this rebellion, huh? Even mm-hmm. this rebellion. <laughs> yeah, no, well said. Love it. Uh, love it. Uh, and and uh, it was uh, a lot of the Star Wars history this week was, uh, you know, Return of the Jedi released in different countries and everything. I was like, oh, I need something good. And then it was Jimmy Smith's birthday. Man, we, we really love Jimmy Smith around here. We love Bail Organa. And yes, we collectively hope we get more Bail and Brea in Star Wars and some little Leia for that matter, too. All right, my friends, we are done. We're out of here today. We've looked at the news. We've looked at Star Wars history. It is time to go. We are the Force Center Podcast feed. We can be found on Twitter at Force Center Pod, or Instagram and YouTube as well. If you haven't checked out the YouTube channel yet, get over there, uh, subscribe. We're starting to put other content up there uh, that uh, is not just uh, a rebroadcast of our shows. But we also have that up there as well. Uh, so check that out. Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. Podcast available on Acast, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and more. Uh, if you're on Apple Podcasts, uh, or anything that takes, uh, you know, um, 
a rating and a review. We'd love to have you do that to help out the <laughs> show, uh, but especially Apple. Uh, merch is available at tpublic.com slash user slash force center. And you can support us directly at patreon.com slash force center. Uh, I'm at Ken Napsack or Ken If you're down in uh, San Diego for Comic-Con on July 21st, be doing a comedy show there with Mark Ellis and friends at the American Comedy Company. Ticket information on my website. We also always, always like to highlight charities, uh, things to put your energies in. There's always, there's a lot going on, but we're still supporting the What Choice Star Wars fan for abortion access GoFundMe that is uh, still going strong. Uh, you can go to GoFundMe.com slash F slash what dash choice to donate and get more information there. Jennifer. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Jennifer Landa and TikTok at Jennifer Landa 1138. Um, oh, yes, yeah, StarWars.com. My article is up there about the Reva HasLab Force Effects uh, Elite Lightsaber <laughs> campaign that's been going on. So be sure to check that out. Um, and today, as we know, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, uh, which will obviously have unimaginable consequences on countless people and families. So I am spotlighting the National Network of Abortion Funds. Uh, the Abortion Funds Network provides financial assistance, travel, lodging, and many other types of support to abortion seekers. You can donate and find out more about their work at abortion funds.org there you go there you go joseph yeah uh, i will uh, second uh, both of those organizations um that you both listed uh but i also want to continue to advocate for a uh, vote forward it is a service where you write letters to other voters encouraging them to use their power if you want to look into that you can go to their website at votefwd.org Love and for myself, stuff. you can find me Twitter, Instagram, TikTok is at Joseph Scrimshaw and all my other stuff on my website, josephscrimshaw.com. There you go, my friends. There you go. That's it for this week. So for Reva, for Cody, wherever he is, and Jimmy Smits and the cast of LA Law, thank you for listening. This was Force Center.